Now it's your stage. Worshe Jika. Jika Hanku. I'm a geek, and I believe that being a geek uh, is very cool. Because geeks know how to program, and they know how to make things. And in today's age, these are superpowers. Now, I grew up watching Lost in Space. And I used to fantasize about entering the story and joining the robot and Will Robinson on their adventures. I used to think that Will Robinson, who's a comp uh, computer prodigy, was really, really cool. So you may not know the robots in uh, Lost in Space, but surely you know these other beloved robots, and most recently, uh, these, this robot. Now, these are wonderful science fiction robots, and I love them because they are intelligent machines that interact with their environments and with other people and make often very surprising and very creative decisions. But today's real robots are not like this. In fact, um, we have come a long way since 1921, when the Czech playwright Karol Kapek introduced uh, the word robot to denote hard and repetitive labor. And today, some people fear a robot doing a man's job, and some people are wildly excited by it. For example, Stephen Hawking thinks the robots will take our jobs, and Elon Musk thinks we won't need to drive in five years' time, we can fall asleep at the wheel. So there are many different dreams and ideas in the space of uh, uh, robots. But many of us uh, really dream to create a machine in our own image that is smart and obedient. And this dream goes all the way to the beginnings of mankind. From the technological marvels and artifacts of antiquity, to the 17th and 18th century Swiss automata that could read, write, and play musical instruments, to science fiction, to today's reality, the, vacu the cleaning robots. And today's reality, today's robots are becoming increasingly more lifelike. So all along mankind, we have been dreaming about making machines uh, that would help us. And today's robots are really having a big impact. From near and small, for example, using robots in surgery, to big and far, for example, using robots to explore Mars, from manufacturing to robots in the home. Robots are having an impact and are making the world a better place. But it's important to figure out that um, robots require certain properties. Science fiction robots make decisions by, their, uh, by themselves. But the Swiss automata, and in general automata, do not make decisions because they cannot be programmed. In order to have a robot, we need to have a physical embodiment, a physical machine, that can take input from the physical world using sensors, can reason about this input, and can adaptively make decisions, take action in the physical world. These machines have to be programmable and have to be embodied in the physical world. So if you remote control a machine, that's not a robot. If you have a machine that you simply talk to, but it doesn't move, it doesn't do anything other than responding by voice, that's also not a robot. Now, Robots come in many different form factors, and they do many different things. And here is a collection of some robots that you may have come across. In order to have an effective machine, in order to have a robot, you need the machine to have a body that is capable of the skills required by the task. And then you, have the you need to have the machine to have a brain that is capable of controlling the body to execute those tasks. So 
each robot we have today has a body capable of some tasks and a brain capable of controlling the body. And to give you an illustration of body and brain, I just want to talk very briefly about a project I have been working on right here in Asia, actually in Singapore, to create self-driving cars. And these are the bodies that um, go with our fleet of self-driving cars. And the idea behind these robots is that they will provide mobility on demand. Um, if you have ever ridden a bike from a sharing bike system, perhaps you know that um, because people tend to go to the same places, the stations where the bikes are deposited, some of them become depleted of bikes and others become oversupplied. And then cities have to hire people and trucks to rebalance um, the bike stations. But what if the bikes could drive themselves so there wouldn't be people involved in the, um, in the aspect of rebalancing? Well, this was the idea behind the project we started in Singapore. We wanted to create self-driving cars to provide mobility on demand. The idea is you tell the system, you tell your robots, I want to go to the location of Geek Park from my hotel. And a robot arrives to take you there. So once you, the robot dro drops you off, the robot talks with the other robots in the system, with the people with public transportation, and knows where it needs to drive itself in order to, um, uh, to get the next customer. So that's the idea of, uh, of um, mobility on demand with self-driving cars. All right, let's look in greater detail at the body and the brain of this robot. So this is the body. The body consists of a regular car. In this case, it's a golf cart. And this golf cart is extended with a few additional sensors. In this case, we have just a few laser scanners that are able to look around at the world to make maps and to, um, to localize the robot and to identify obstacles in the environment. All right, so given this body, we have a suite of algorithms that controls this body to do interesting things. So what does this robot have to do? Well, it has to drive autonomously uh, without bumping into obstacles. Uh, it has to stay on the road. It has to be able to follow the road. And it has to be able to um, uh, localize itself on the road. So here's our robot uh, with a capability that enables it to map the world and to figure out where in the world um, the robot is. Now, um, in addition to that, the robot also has to look for pedestrians and for other um, obstacles, other cars and other objects in the road. Um, so here's the robot again driving around and um, uh, using its capability to avoid obstacles. The robot also is able to interact uh, with other cars. It's able to stop to yield for another car to, um, uh, to go in the system, um, and, and much, much more. So given this robot, um, we have been interested in knowing whether people would enjoy having such a robot. So about a year ago, we took our fleet of robots to the Chinese gardens in Singapore. And here you can see a map of what the gardens look like. And we identified five locations uh, in the space that are pick up and drop off locations. And we gave people the ability to book rides for specific times. So you could sit in the comfort of your own home, uh, book a ride, and at the designated time, you'd arrive at, at your pickup location. The car would uh, take you to your designated location. And then the car could figure out who else is waiting in the queue. Now, the Chinese gardens is a fairly um, simple environment. You can see the maps. In, uh, you can see the map. You can see in red all the roads. Uh, we don't have really fast-moving cars in this environment, but we have people, we have bicyclists, and uh, we have other golf carts. And over about a week, 500 people um, took uh, rides from us. So uh, let's watch these people in action. So here is the robot at the Chinese gardens, and uh, you can see sort of what the, what the road looks like. Uh, you can see that the, um, the roads, the pathways, are very much like in a, in a regular city, but uh, there are no cars. That's the only difference. And from this point of view, the environment is, uh, is a little bit uh, simpler. But still, there are other obstacles. So now let's see what the user said. Awesome. Yeah, awesome, because this is our very first time. <laughs> 
No, the piece was alright and um, when there are two guys working in front, right, it actually slowed down. This will help uh, other people with mobility problems, disabled, even children and families that um, don't really suit it for walking long distances to come to the garden as well. So I think we have early adopters. <laughs> anyway, this is what could happen if you develop the body of a robot and then the brain of the robot that can control the body to do a task that is good for all. Now, what I want to tell you today is that if you consider our self-driving car, if you consider uh, the humanoid robots that exist today, each of these robots took many years to develop. So today, it really takes way, way too much time to make new robots. I like to say that the state of making a new robot is kind of like where we were in computer science before we invented the compiler, when we were, uh, when we were programming in machine language or in assembly language. And it took a very long time to write the simplest program. So the question is, what can we do better? How can we use technology to innovate, to speed up how we create robots? Well, one idea I have been interested in for many, many years is to create a universal module, kind of like a cell, kind of like the cell we have in our bodies, and to use that in order to make any kind of robot. And many years ago, I had the idea that if we could do this, um, then we could make all sorts of cool things. Like, for instance, we could make our couches turn into electronic pets and vice versa. So this is a video that shows the dog couch. Um, uh, this, uh, this dog couch was um, created as a concept uh, maybe about 15 years ago. And let me tell you, we still can't do this. <laughs> but we have made a lot of progress that was inspired by the vision that we could have a universal robot that could be the basis of making any robot we want in the world. So uh, he here's what we have done. So, we don't have the dog couch, but we have been developing uh, these little cells that could at some point become the modular units in the dog couch. And this one is called the M block. Uh, this robot has a very magical co um, component inside the robot. Um, the robot, oops, this is uh, something's happened to the video, um, so let me see. So the robot has a very magical component. And this magical component uh, consists of, um, oops, nope, uh, the previous one. Let's go back. Uh, this, I'm, I apologize. So the, the cube robot has a wheel that spins very, uh, very fast inside. And um, the, uh, when, when we stop that wheel suddenly, there is stored momentum that causes the cube to jump forward. And this is how, the, uh, this, is how this uh, robot uh, works. Now, you can see the mechanism with a wheel inside the robot. And we can turn this wheel on any direction we want. And in doing that, we can get the robot to, um, to move, to leap forward. You can, we can get the robot to turn directions, to leap in a different direction. So here's the robot thinking about changing directions. And we can get the robot to do all sorts of other magical movements, like multiple robots can coordinate. And uh, they, can, they can move together to create new structures. So in this case, we have a gap, and we need to move some modules from one side of the structure to the other. And here are the robots essentially using the ability to move um, and creating a bridge that allows the robots to move from one side um, to another. And uh, the robot can also do other things, like uh, it can do uh, big jumps. And uh, you can see the robot uh, making, uh, making new things. So it's not quite the dog couch, but it's a significant step towards the dog couch. Now, the biggest challenge with this robot is that it's a little bit big. It's about five centimeters um, on, on the side. And so one question we might ask is, how small can we make these robots? And so here's the smallest we've been able to make um, these robots. We call this a smart pebble. And it's a cube that's about one centimeter in, in uh, size. And this cube has a very magical component inside. It's the uh, it's the little brown element there that we call an electropermanent magnet. This electropermanent magnet 
can be used to program connections, can be used to communicate, and can be used uh, to pass power. And so not, that's not bad for something that is half a millimeter in size. All right, so let's see what, um, what we can do with these uh, cubes. So uh, you can see the cube uh, relative to the size uh, of, a, of a human hand. And you can see many other cubes around it. Um, when the cubes flash, that means that they communicate using this uh, magical component. Um, so in this system, uh, we are commanding the robots to come together and uh, form an, um, uh, a new kind of object. So we are, we are starting by creating kind of like a, a block of electronic marble. And then in this block of electronic marble, what we would like to say to this, um, to this uh, uh, block is, well, make me a humanoid robot, or make me a dog-shaped robot, or make me a wheel-based robot. And we'd like for these modules to kind of talk to each other to figure out who should be in, who should be out. And eventually, we would like to create a connected piece that only con contains the desired shape. So in other words, we would like for the system to sculpt itself. Imagine having a bag of smart sand and telling the, the bag of smart sand, make me a rabbit. You reach inside the bag, you pull the rabbit out, you play with the rabbit for a while, and when you're done with it, uh, you return the, um, the rabbit back to the bag, and now all the particles of the rabbit become components to be reused later. So here's our system that has already made um, the humanoid uh, robot. Now, what is an easy way to program shape, to, make, um, uh, to, to tell such a smart bag of sand to make new things? So here's the idea. Suppose you could dip the object that you're trying to make inside the smart sand, and then some special computation could figure out what is it that you have dipped and it could create an object of exactly the same size and shape. So can we do this? Well, what do we need to do this? Well, the first thing we need uh, is the, the smart grain of sand. And I've already shown you inside the pebble that we have those smart grain of sands. And then we need the, uh, the brain. We need the algorithms that are able to go around in, uh, among these, um, uh, these smart particles, learn the shape of the object that uh, we would like to create. And once that shape is learned, recreate another identical obstacle. And here you can see a simulation uh, of particles uh, that shows you how an algorithm is able to learn the perimeter of the object that we are trying to reproduce. And then using that perimeter, you can create an exact identical copy or more. You can even scale it. You can make objects of all sorts of different sizes. So here is the replica of our humanoid uh, robot that has been created tra by tracing um, the original shape we have, um, we have dipped in. So can we make this for real? Well, here is the smart pebble again. And uh, the same algorithm that was run in simulation is going to run in just a few seconds for you to show you how you can use this very, very magical uh, small robot to, um, to, um, to copy the shape of a, in this case, it's a very simple shape. It's just a, a shape of this double um, square. Uh, so here, we're manually creating the initial block. And, uh, and uh, as we add new components to the system, the components talk to each other and uh, try to determine whether they are adjacent to the perimeter of some other component that needs to be copied. So using this technology, you might imagine how in the future 3D printing, 3D fabrication could be taken to a whole new level of intelligence and of capability. Now, this is the final shape of the algorithm, where you can see the flickering lights that show that the modules are talking with one another. And uh, now, um, now, pretty soon, we see that all the connections between the particles are broken, except for the connections that give us an identical copy of the object we tried to create. 
So I have been really wondering about these cellular robots for a long time, and we've made some progress, but we still can't do the dog couch. And another question we may ask that we started asking recently is, um, OK, so can we do a different paradigm? So instead of making one universal robot that could be anything to any, any other robots, can we make custom robots very fast? So here's the concept. Suppose there is a shop. And anybody could go to that shop to make a robot. So we have a user. Let's call her Alice. Alice has a cat. And perhaps Alice wants to have a robot that will entertain her cat while she is at work. So imagine Alice heading to 24-hour robot manufacturing, where equipped with a user interface that is fairly intuitive, so Alice wouldn't have to know much about robots, she could select a design. And uh, an hour later, she could get a robot, and the program required for her cat to play with a robot. So, OK. Um, so here's how we imagine this. Suppose you take your favorite text editor and you say, I want a robot to play chess with me. And then suppose you have a suite of steps, much like in compilation, where you parse the specifications, you get, um, uh, you parse the specifications, you get the, um, you get the um, all the com uh, mechanical components uh, required. You determine the behaviors. You assemble the components. You send the components to a pr 3D printer, and success. You're done. You have your robot that can play chess with you. And here's the robot that was computed in about two hours. Uh, using on the order of uh, $10 of components. Now, this robot was not computed entirely automatically, uh, but nevertheless, many of the steps of making this robot uh, were automated. So it's qu quite remarkable. You can make a new robot in on the matter of two hours if you have access to the right design and fabrication tools. So let's see how um, this works. So say you have a user, call her Alice or Daniela. The user imagines a new robot that the user wants, in this case, uh, an insect-shaped robot. Well, the user thinks about what are the, uh, the rough abstract behaviors. And then the system is able to search a big database and figure out what mechanical components and electronic components in the database can deliver on this uh, behavior. Once the components are identified, a program can automatically figure out where the components go. The program figures out all the files that, need, uh, that are necessary to send to 3D printers and other rapid prototyping facilities. And then you push a button, and here's your robot. So um, let's see this in action. Now here is a movie that shows uh, this process, that shows what we're able to do. So let's imagine many different kinds of robots. We have a database that has a lot of robot components. So if we want an insect-shaped robot, uh, we might want a pair of legs and a third leg to go in between. We might also want a body that will hold the brain and the sensors and everything else. So scanning the database, we can identify the components. We can establish the parameters, the size of these components. And then a program will assemble them or will place them um, uh, all together for us to make the final, uh, pr uh, the final object. Then the, robot will uh, then the program will uh, spit out the design file that could then be cut with scissors, sent to a 3D printer, sent to a vinyl cutter. So you can go, you can go from a flat sheet uh, to uh, a cut sheet that specifies the body of your robot, uh, in, in, uh, depending on what technology you have available to you. And then the user manually folds the robot. Um, once the robot is folded, the robot has a computer, an embedded computer in it, and there is an app that can be instantiated to control that very robot. So all of this is done very fast, and it's done in a custom way. And you, too, can have a robot in about two hours uh, if you use this method. All right.
Now, the slowest step in this process is the manual folding of the body of the robot. So we have been wondering, what can we do to speed that up? And we had the idea that perhaps you can bake your own robot. So for instance, you see a robot in here that is being baked in an, that is literally baked in an oven. So how does this work? What's the magic sauce? Well, here's the magic sauce. We make the robots using a three-layer body, where the top and the bottom layer are structural. And in the middle, we have a special material that has the ability to shrink when exposed to heat. If you know about shrinky dinks, these are, these are classical toys that kids play with. The material in the middle is sh shrinky dink. Now, by cutting different size gaps in the top and bottom layers, you can control the different angles uh, these robots will form. So here's how the process works. You show the, uh, the system a picture of the robot you would like to create. And from that picture, you can automatically create a mesh version of that robot. You can unfold the mesh to create a flat sheet. And you can send that sheet to your favorite laser cutter, 3D printer, um, to create the unfolded uh, version of your robot. Then you put the robot, or you expose the robot to heat, and the flat sheet turns into a functional 3D object. And here's, here it goes. Uh, we can see. Uh, one, one type of machine that you can make with a system. So we call these origami robots. And these origami robots can actually literally get up and go. So starting from a flat sheet, the robot forms this three-dimensional sheet. And then this robot can be controlled, can be made to go in any environment uh, you want. In fact, the robot can swim. The, the robot moves very fast. It can move four body lengths a second. So that means this robot can run in human terms. The robot can also carry objects, and it can, um, it can uh, crawl through piles of stuff. Now, the way this works, the way the control works is as follows. This robot lives in, an, in a big magnetic field that can be programmed. So by programming the coils on this magnetic field, we can select the direction in which uh, this robot moves. And once we're done with the robot, we can get this robot to recycle itself. So we can get this robot to go to uh, a recycling pl uh, place, and the robot's dissolved. All right, so using this method, we can print many different kinds of robots. Here's one kind of very capable insect robot that um, uh, we talked about. And this robot can be made to do many different things. It can be made to move in very agile ways. In this case, the robot is following a line. We can make many different kinds of robots uh, with this approach. So we can make wheel-based robots. We can make um, insect leg-based robots. We can make robot manipulators. We can make quad rotors. We can make robots that can uh, move and uh, pinch things, much like ants. Now, if we can make so many different kinds of robots, we really will get to the point of creating a world rich with robots. And in this world rich with robots, we will have a lot of disruption in how we live, how we play, and how we work. So for example, shopping might look like this. Say you wake up in the morning, and you decide to send your robot to the store to fetch you whatever your fa favorite breakfast is. Mine happens to be fresh fruit and fresh bread. But maybe there are some, um, maybe there is a place that has fresh, yummy dumplings that, uh, that could come straight to you. Or you may decide to go to, uh, to the store yourself. Your, your parents or grandparents may decide to go to the store. They might arrive in a self-driving car. At the store, there will be a world abuzz with robots. Some robots uh, will help um, stack shelves. Other robots will help uh, deliver packages to customers. The carts will be robots. The carts could drive you straight to the, um, uh, to the um, shelves that contain the products that you want. And they will tell you all about the products, their freshness, their provenance, uh, and uh, the the, maybe the nutritional content. If you're blind, these cards will help you get around. So by the way, anybody know how many robots there are in this picture? Any guess? 
OK, there are 19 robots in this picture. So I will just uh, leave it up for, uh, for one second to see if you can actually find all 19 pictures. This is, a, this is an extraordinary possibility for the future of robotics. If we can create robots fast, if we can make their brains very capable, we will create a world in which many robots will be working with many people to accomplish many different tasks to make the world a better place and to make our lives better. Now, there are many questions that uh, come up when we think about um, this new world order. So we may ask, um, should the making of robots be regulated? And it's, if so, at what level? How should we test the safety of the robots? And to what standards should we hold robots? And who is liable? So if your self-driving car uh, bumps, uh, causes an accident, or if your drone touches something, causes an accident, collides with something it's not supposed to, who should be responsible? Is it the fault of the manufacturer? Is it the fault of the programmer? Is it the fault um, of, the, um, of the person controlling the robot? Who is responsible? These are all questions that are very important and require technologists and policymakers to come together. There's also the question of how do we come up with policies for uh, using machines? Right now, in the United States, each state is thinking separately about self-driving car regulations. And I, I know that every country is different. Every country is reasoning separately. But the question is, what would happen if we have this, um, uh, this mishmash of policies, different policies coming from different directions? I think it's important uh, to consider cohesively across the planet policies for using robots. And ultimately, a big question is, should policymakers incentivize the creation of machines and the use of machines? For example, for self-driving cars, we can decide to make instrumented highways that will promote the use of robots on highways. These are all very important questions uh, we don't have answers to, but they're on the minds of many, many people. And as we think about creating a future of pervasive machines, a future rich with robots, we have to keep these in mind. Now, this idea of pervasive robotics is actually not that far-fetched and not that crazy, and I really believe in it. And the idea of pervasive robotics is really not that different from pervasive computing. In the 1990s, Mark Weiser, who was a chief scientist at Xerox Spark, had the big dream that someday everyone will have a computer, and computers will be used ubiquitously by everyone. All right, so just think about it. 20 years later, we actually have a world of pervasive computing. Computing has become part of life. Everyone knows how to use a computer. Everyone uses computers. We have integrated computing in the fabric of our lives. And I really love the, his quote that says, the most profound technologies are those that disappear. They weave themselves into the fabric of everyday life until they are indistinguishable from it. We have already observed this for computation. And next is the turn of robots. It's robots' turn to become pervasively integrated to help people and to make life uh, better for all of us. Now, today, I think we have a real privilege. We live in a world where what we do matters, and what we do uh, is having a big impact. We have democratized computation. For every computational task out there, there is an app. So if you need to do something, you just go to the App Store, and there's a program that will do what you want. Everyone can use computation for whatever tasks they need. And well, let's see. My slides have disappeared. Can we put the slides back up? The next step is to do the same for robots. And just like the App Store has democratized the access to computation, the idea of using robots to democratize physical tasks is equally profound. 
And if we can democratize robots, if we can create one robot for anybody who wants to use a robot, who needs help with a physical task, we will be able to create so many different robots. And for us geeks here, what's not to love? Yes, yes.